Well, a very big welcome to everyone. Welcome to our Mental Health Awareness Week 2020. My name is Natalie Ashdown from the Open Door Coaching Group, and I'm really delighted to have on the line with us today Tanya Heaney Voot from Wombara Coaching at Wombara Consulting and Georgie Chapman from HR Legal. And welcome also to Nick McEwen Hall from the Open Door team who's on the line this morning. So today, Today's webinar is focused on a strategic pro approach to workplace mental health and well-being, a little bit different from the other webinars we've been holding during our Mental Health Awareness Week. So we're really looking forward to the presentation. Just before we begin, uh, let me firstly um, acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians on the lands on which we meet today and their continuing connection to the land, waters and communities of Australia. And we pay res our respects to them and to their elders past, present and emerging and anyone who might be on the line today who is of an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander descent. So it's a pleasure to introduce our fabulous to people who are going to be speaking with us today and sharing their ideas on a strategic approach to workplace mental health and wellbeing. Let me quickly introduce you to Tanya. Um, she's a subject matter expert in the field of uh, well, um, workplace wellbeing, and she supports clients to develop healthy mental uh, healthy, mentally healthy workplaces, uh, drawing on an evidence-based practice and guidelines and experience. Um, she's a pro size certified change practitioner with extensive experience in the people side of change, very important, and understands the realities of trying to influence cultural change within an organisation. Uh, she's a research assistant on leadership wellbeing with Deakin University School of Business, a workplace and leadership coach, uh, and she's an accredited mental health first aid practitioner. And with her and joined by her is Georgie Chapman from HR Legal. Welcome, Georgie, who's got substantial experience in both litigious and non-litigious um, employment and workplace relations. Georgie acts for a wide range of employees on matters including discrimination, industrial relations, occupational health and safety, and employee termination related issues. Um, appreciating the complexity of law, Georgie strives to assist clients to navigate the legal minefield of employment law, particularly uh, when misconceptions and uncertainty about what can and cannot be done hinder the decision-making process. So Georgie has a passion for supporting employers into the employers into the best practice space, um, including delivering training around matters such as workplace mental health and managing family and domestic violence in the workplace. So as you can tell, um, both of our, our uh, both Tanya and Georgia have a wealth of knowledge of experience to join, uh, to share with us today. And uh, we were commenting just before the webinar started that one of the best things about this is now we can just hand over to you both um, and we can all sit back and, uh, and really um, learn from you. So thank you so much. And let me, uh, let me uh, share the... Let me hand over the controls to you. Um, if anyone would like to uh, interact with us and ask Tanya or Georgie questions, feel free to do that. The best way to do that is to actually pop a message into the chat box um, and we can pick up your messages and your questions um, from there as we go along. So without further ado, I'll just hand over to yourself, Georgie. I'm oh, sorry, not to you, Georgie. Wrong. I'm handing over to you, Tanya. But my cursor is doing a little bit of uh, its own dance here. Here we go. There you are. And as I mentioned, we'll go on mute now, but if anyone would like to pop a message into the chat box or um, ask questions, we can pick those up as we go along. Thank you so much. Thank you for that very warm welcome, Nat and Nick. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to be here. We're a bit of a dynamic duo, Georgie. We should come up with a nice new name for ourselves. <laughs> so I just wanted to um, explain who we are. I guess we're, you know, we're a collaboration of professionals uh, with a real passion for mentally healthy workplaces and really has been formed on this goodwill to support organisations uh, towards being more psychologically safe and having happy and healthy and productive workplaces, which we all like to work in. So that's a little bit about how we've come to deliver this uh, workshop for you today. Um, as you would have seen on the program, we're really going to look at what a mentally healthy workplace is and why it's so important. And even before COVID hit, 
you know, this was an important um, issue and there was lots of guidance material and um, it's a good reason to do it. Now it's, it's even more so. Uh, we're going to look at why psychological safety is as important as physical safety and Georgie is going to take us through the minimum legal obligations as well. So it'll be nice, well-rounded um, content today. And then I'm going to give you some practical steps on how to go about creating your own workplace mental health and wellbeing strategy and also some sort of change management suggestions and support if you're maybe um, on the way in that journey. And there's lots of resources and support that will guide you towards as well. But the first thing I want to do, actually there's two things I want to do. Firstly, I'd like to just do the chat box. Can you just pop in the size of the organisation um, that you belong to or that you're representing if you're a consultant? Um, I'm really keen to get a sense of whether we're talking to SMEs, larger organisations, a combination of both, when we start to provide some context around the strategy development. Some of the examples I'll use, you know, I just want to know I'm using the right examples because it's quite a different approach to the different size organisation. So I'll check in on those in a minute and see where we are mostly. But the first thing I really wanted to do was a bit of myth, myth busting or terminology clarifying because there's so much different language out there around healthy workplaces and mentally healthy workplaces. And there's just some um, on the screen in front of you and it can be a little bit confusing. So I wanted to just kind of get us all in the right space today and really focus you all on what we're going to talk about and what we mean by mentally healthy workplace. So this is it, essentially. So a mentally healthy workplace, and, and what we'll be guiding you on today, is a workplace that has a strategic commitment to promote, protect, and support employees' psychological well-being. So for those of you that have looked at some of these frameworks, promote, protect, support, sometimes written as intervene, are the three guiding pillars. And so these, these form some strategic goals, essentially. But this is what we're talking about when we talk about mentally healthy workplaces. We're talking about that strategic commitment. And essentially what you know, this breaks down to is really about positive workplace culture and everything that contributes to that, which is, which is another topic in itself. Inclusion and diversity and inclusion, but also inclusive practices. For those coaches online, if you've tuned into um, ICF 2020 Transform, you may have seen Timothy Clark's session earlier. Great content on inclusion that was really, really beneficial. And I'll just share quickly with you. Uh, you know, we spoke about psychological safety in that session, and in particular, um, feeling vulnerable to take a risk to challenge the status quo. And the research he's undertaken shows that, you know, 48% of people who were punished for doing so intentionally then diminish their work um, efforts and productivity. So we can see the, the impact on productivity um, if we don't get this right. Harm prevention, OHS, this is probably the, the easiest to conceptualise, and knowledge and support. So having that strategic commitment is about raising awareness and, and sharing knowledge about what um, good mental wellbeing looks like and how to achieve that, and also sharing knowledge about the fact that our all of our mental health varies along this continuum um, all through our life. So this is, an, this is an issue for everybody, for all of us. And showing where we can, showing people where they can get support for those that, that aren't coping or managing so well or that have a mental illness. So some of the guiding material comes out of Heads Up, which is an alliance formed by the Mentally Healthy Workplace Alliance, which is national and beyond blue. And this, the reference is below here. They've got some really good guidance material and that's part of our promise to you today is to, to direct you to some great resources. But there's a little, there's a reference there to what is a mentally healthy workplace. And this, these are the common characteristics. So positive workplace culture, as I mentioned before, stress and other risks to mental health are managed. So we're actually proactively looking to reduce uh, work factors that are known to cause stress, heavy workloads, unrealistic deadlines, um, uncertainty is, is a big issue. So lack of clarity, when we start talking about team effectiveness, we know lack of clarity around roles and responsibilities and uncertainty around expectations is a factor. But it's also a factor for you know, um, poor psychological wellbeing as well. Zero tolerance approach to discrimination. You know, whilst it is legislated, there are still many workplaces that have big issues with this, and Georgie's going to talk to us about this area too, which is great. And I need to move my 
faces so I can see. <laughs> And people with mental health conditions are supported. So we're helping people to stay at work or return to work. Uh, and if you go to the Heads Up website, you'll find they've got some great templates. So you might want to do a review of your current return to work letters and processes. They've got some really good guidance material around this. Because we also know um, in terms of musculoskeletal injuries, which currently head up our work cover claims, uh, you know, this can be quite a significant impact on psychological wellbeing as a result of that. Um, and in fact, there's, you know, rumours that um, psych harm, psych injury claims are going to top, in Victoria, are going to top um, MSK in the next 12, 24 months. And I think it might be sooner, given COVID. So why is having a strategy so important? Uh, you'll notice we've got a couple of little key icons up here for you. Uh, Georgie and Nick and I, we, we often laugh about this. There's very, two different, two very different sides to the coin. Um, when we're approaching mental health and wellbeing with an organisation. And my counsel to you will be, if you're trying to influence a case internally, um, then you need to understand what's going to drive the change makers in your organisation or the decision makers. Is, it, is this a heart argument or is this an economic argument? And we're going to give you lots of good information to inform either business case. For many of us, this is heart-led. We, we have a passion for having, you know, a happy and healthy and a safe workplace. It's a kind place to be and it brings out the best in people and then there's the economic argument that we need to use sometimes to influence um, to get sign off. So having a strategy you know is the best practice recommendation having this sort of integrated systems based approach to mentally to a mentally healthy workplace. Um, a fruit bowl or a yoga class on its own isn't enough they're fabulous activities and they're well-meaning but without the, the strategic approach you won't get the sustainability and you won't get the change, the, the really deeply implemented change that you need um, to be a mentally healthy workplace. Um, you, again, it just shows that you get this combined and top-down focus where you can really look at harm prevention, positive workplace experiences, so culture, diversity and inclusion. Um, positive psych is really rearing its head too in the research, um, strong case for uh, positive psychology activities seeing mindfulness rolling out in workplaces, which is absolutely fabulous. And uh, for those that have been enjoying Nat's morning mindfulness, I'm um, loving that, thanks Nat. And awareness and support. So around reducing the stigma, positive mental wellbeing strategies and return to work and stay at work support. So there are some of the reasons why having this strategy is important. Um, here's some more information to inform your business case. And pre-COVID, the stats were one in five Australians in any given year um, experienced a common mental illness. And for those of you that have done Nick's wonderful mental health first aid, if you haven't, I highly recommend it. It's awesome. And it's online, so it's very convenient now. Um, yeah, one in five Australians pre-COVID. I've seen an article from ARI, the Australian Human Resources Institute, yesterday, where they're now saying three in five Australians um, as a result of COVID. So that's pretty significant. And obviously, you know, if you look at the number of people you have in your workplace, it gives you an indication of how many people are likely to have a common mental illness. So you're supporting those people, but we're also trying to protect everybody else. The Productivity Commission um, released their draft report into the impact of mental health last October. I think we're waiting on the, uh, the final report to come out currently. It's been tabled, I believe. And they're estimating the cost of workplace absenteeism and presenteeism due to mental ill health at around 13 to 17 billion per year. Now that's huge. Um, work over costs, as I mentioned, you know, there's a rumor in Victoria that we'll be overtaking um, MSK with psych injury or psych harm claims. In New South Wales, there's been some recent um, developments that the government have released a code uh, for psychological health in the workplace as a result of the fact that their growth in psych injury claims um, was 54% from 14, 15 to 18, 19, compared to only 3.5% for physical injury. So that is a massive, massive um, disparity and probably is really pointing quite clearly to where we need to be focusing our efforts. Legal compliance that Georgie is going to get us all across um, and we'll be absolutely aware of our requirements there. And here's the hard argument, you know, that caring for your employees is good business, right? It's actually also the economic argument. Um, it's definitely associated with higher productivity. There's lots of research that supports all of these things that I've listed there. 
Um, the Diversity Council of Australia had some great data around um, the benefit to the workplace for an inclusive environment in terms of productivity um, you know, and diversity, creating um, fueling innovation and, and more team cohesion and collaboration. So there's such a good argument from that kind of workplace culture perspective. Some references down the bottom to direct you to get some of that information, but I'm always very happy. Take a screenshot if you want, but the slides won't get sent out. So take screenshots of anything that you want, folks. Um, yeah, I'm always happy, uh, make contact, I'm always happy to share this information to help you with your business case. Now, I might just check in um, with the comments. Um, Nat, do you want to just share where the people, the comments around the size of workplace, where were we? Yes, absolutely. We've got a huge range actually from um, around 100 people, Tanya, through to 6,500. So some people have got, um, they're saying um, 1,000, um, James says 500 to 1,000. Um, uh, Karina's from the Prom Country Aged Care, welcome to the line, with 125. So yes, yeah, so a really big range of um, organisations plus, plus uh, numbers within the organisation. Yeah, okay, well, that's great. So I'll, you know, when I start unpacking, um, you know, what your strategy might look like and how to go about it, I'll give you some examples from the clients that I've worked with across that sort of, those numbers in the organisation. Um, it's quite a different approach for smaller organisations to those larger entities. Okay, thanks, Nat. All right, I'm very pleased to hand over to the wonderful Georgie, who's going to make things very clear for you all now around your legislative requirements. Thank you, Georgie. Just sing out Thank when you need slides. Will do. Thanks, Tanya, and thanks everyone for tuning in today. Um, so in terms of the myriad of legal considerations when it comes to managing mental health in the workplace, um, I'm sure it won't come as a surprise to anyone that the overarching obligation comes from our safety um, obligations. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the fact we have state-based legislation around uh, workplace health and safety. Um, but, you know, really the obligation is consistent um, despite the different legislation in that it imposes an obligation on employers, if we're talking about Victoria or persons conducting a business or undertaking, if we're under the model legislation, to provide and maintain so far as is reasonably practicable a safe working environment. Um, and when we're talking about safety, I think traditionally, you know, 10 years ago when we talk about safety, everyone thinks about physical safety and, you know, to some extent that's still the case. But it's always been the case that safety includes psychological safety and the legislation makes it really clear. Uh, and certainly, you know, there's been research done by Beyond Blue when they've um, surveyed workers and workers have indicated in terms of their priorities, psychological safety actually outranks physical safety. So psychological safety does need to be a priority for all workplaces. And I'm sure that, you know, that's the reason you're tuning in today. Um, and part of that um, obligation, you know, includes monitoring health of employees, which is really important, particularly in this space, because I think we'll all acknowledge that when we're dealing with psychological safety or someone who's perhaps experiencing a mental health problem or a mental illness, it's less visible than a physical condition. So if someone has um, an injury that they've suffered on the weekend and they come limping into work, you know, we're likely to remark on that, whereas it's um, less visible when we're dealing with mental health conditions. And so it's even more important that um, we have um, more knowledge and skills in this space so that um, leaders in particular and managers um, are able to, you know, identify those early warning signs and act on them um, so that hopefully things don't escalate further. Um, and we'll talk about that in due course. Uh, on the flip side of things, employees have their own obligations um, to take reasonable care for their own safety and for that of others. And part of that is presenting to work in a fit state capable of fulfilling the inherent requirements of their role. Um, and in an ideal world, what that would mean is if they're suffering um, in terms of their mental well-being, that they would actually be raising that with um, their manager um, or with the in the workplace so that you know there can be appropriate supports put in place. Of course, what we've seen is that we have continuing stigma around 
uh, mental illness in our community. And so there is still a reluctance to make those sorts of disclosures. I think we're definitely heading in the right direction. I've certainly heard anecdotally from clients that people are more willing to have these conversations or raise concerns about their own well-being. But I think we still have quite a long way to go. Um, and that's you know even more reason why some of the things we'll talk about today are really important to sort of break down that stigma and normalise discussions around mental health in the workplace. Um, one of the common concerns that I have put to me by clients in this space and around asking questions of an individual around their well-being is concerns about discrimination and um, Tan's already alluded to this. We have protections both at state and federal level around discrimination in the workplace on the basis of disability and that includes a, a mental illness. Um, and so there can be a concern that, you know, if someone makes a disclosure that they're experiencing a mental illness, that any um, action the employer may take will be unlawful discrimination. Um, and it's important to understand those protections are in place um, and also that there are additional obligations in terms of making reasonable adjustments for an employee uh, who's experiencing um, a disability, including a mental illness, which enables them to then fulfill the inherent requirements of their role. Um, and it's really important in terms of inherent requirements um, that we understand that disability discrimination legislation doesn't mean that if someone has a disability such as a mental illness that you need to change the inherent requirements of their role. Um, they still need to be able to fulfill the inherent requirements of their role, but we might need to be able to put supports in place that um, you know, enable them to do that. So when I'm just as a sidebar, when I'm talking about inherent requirements, what those are are the key physical, cognitive and psychosocial requirements of a role. Um, and I think traditionally uh, employers have been quite good at ascertaining what are the physical requirements. Um, but, you know, going a bit more into the detail of what are the um, cognitive and psychosocial requires a bit more um, thought and support, but it's just as important. So to give you an example, it might be that someone is applying for a job in um, a call centre and they have a history of experiencing anxiety and obviously a call centre has um, is a, quite a high pressure environment. Um, and the, potentially putting them in that environment might put them at risk of an exacerbation of their condition. So there'll need to be a, a conversation around, you know, are there reasonable adjustments we can put in place to enable you to fulfill the inherent requirements of being in that role. Um, so these are some of the, the, the types of um, considerations around meeting your obligation in reasonable adjustments, but also making sure someone is capable of fulfilling the inherent requirements of their role. So they're also safe in that role, which is the critical piece. I also get asked um, uh, a lot of questions around privacy and I think traditionally everyone regarded um, mental health, um, mental illness as a very much a personal thing and something to be left at the door of the workplace. And of course, I think we've moved beyond that now um, to a large extent, but there is still that concern around, you know, if I ask a question around mental wellbeing, you know, do they have to tell me? Should that be covered by privacy legislation? And the take home message is that um, you should be asking questions and we'll talk about how that happens in a moment. But in terms of any information that you're collecting or receiving around someone's health, that's considered to be sensitive information. And so it does need to be true treated um, carefully, you need that person's consent to collect it, you need to make sure you're not making disclosures of it, you know, at will, um, which I'm sure would be, you know, best practice in any case, but it is important from the legal perspective as well. However, um, the rider on that is if there is a concern about an, an imminent risk to someone's health and safety, um, you are able to make disclosures um, around their sensitive information. So an example in this space would be if someone um, had disclosed, for instance, that they're experiencing depression and they're risking self-harm, of course you can um, get them help and if in the co course of doing so you are um, instructing you know whether it's um, paramedics or what have you that um, they are experiencing depression and you're aware of that that's not going to be a breach of your privacy obligations and likewise individuals in an ideal world should be um, disclosing if their mental um, health or their mental illness poses a risk to their health and safety or that of others. And finally, bullying, um, something that we're hearing more and more about in Australian workplaces. And um, typically or traditionally, this has been the purview of a work health and safety legislation in that employers need to prevent repeated unreasonable 
behaviour that creates that risk to health and safety, and that's our bullying definition in a nutshell. And I'm sure we can all accept that having that sort of behaviour in the workplace is going to create a, a clear risk to health and safety and psychological safety um, in particular. Um, but it is important to understand that reasonable management action does not amount to bullying. So if our leaders are carrying out reasonable management action, um, it's not going to satisfy the definition of bullying. And more importantly, it's not going to create that risk to health and safety or psychological safety. And there's a clear um, you know, connect here with workers comp, which Tanya's already mentioned. Um, and so in terms of you know, potentially um, having these behaviours in the workplace, that's where we can see um, workers' comp claims being made. And what we know around um, psych workers' comp claims is that they're typically very difficult to manage. And, you know, there's stats around having someone return to the workplace if they've been, I think it's absent beyond about 70 days is, you know, it plummets in terms of the likelihood that they'll return to work. And obviously there can then be that flow and effect for premiums. So um, it's also important just in this space to mention that in terms of reasonable management action, if we have a stress claim that's made um, in circumstances where the alleged injury has arisen um, as a result of reasonable management action taken on reasonable grounds, um, there's a carve out from the entitlement to compensation. So it's yet another reason why it's important to make sure our leaders are uh, carrying out management action in a reasonable manner, but of course, the most important reason is so that people, um, you know, are behaving inappropriately in the workplace and that's going to reduce the risk um, to, you know, issues with mental health arising in our workplaces. So that's the legal framework in a nutshell. Um, Tan, we might move on to the next slide now. I did want to focus in on safety specifically because obviously that is the overriding um, matter. I've just lost the slides there, Tanya, but I've got your lovely face. So that's okay. Um, so in terms of psychological safety, um, I do want to reiterate that it is as, as important as physical safety, but it's not always as visible. Um, and what the law in effect requires of us is that we're proactively identifying hazards and eliminating risks so far as is reasonably practicable and not just managing the consequences. So often what I get requests for assistance with are around, you know, this um, particular issue has arisen, you know, help us to manage it. And of course you can do that, but in an ideal world, you'd be implementing a whole lot of measures that um, reduce the risk of these sorts of issues actually arising down the track. Um, so not just managing those consequences. Um, it's really important to emphasize in terms of your safety obligations that the legislation doesn't require you to diagnose or treat uh, workers and it, you know, I wouldn't advise it either. Um, what we see from time to time is there can be well-meaning um, managers or leaders who perhaps have a bit of an understanding of mental illness. They've identified perhaps some indications someone in their team might be experiencing a mental illness and they um, perhaps you know, in a well-meaning way, you know, share that with that individual um, and that can create further issues or um, there can be a situation where they have become a quasi counsellor to a member of their team because they're trying to be supportive. And while being supportive is really important, um, you know, that's not the role of the leader and it can also create potentially hazards for their mental well-being if they're becoming that counselling role and, um, you know, that the member of the team is leaning on them. So um, we don't need you to be diagnosing or treating, but what we want is that you're um, monitoring health of employees so that you're identifying those early warning signs, you're having the supportive conversations and then, you know, if there is a concern that someone's not um, coping so well, then you're providing them with the support to seek, you know, professional assistance, as well as putting in place workplace support so far as is reasonably practicable. Um, and as I've already said, um, you know, the potential legal risks could be around breaches of work health and safety legislation. It's less likely we're going to see, um, you know, full on prosecutions by um, the safety authorities it can happen, but um, less likely to be the case. You could see more likely some lower level compliance activity. So certainly as far as work, um, WorkSafe Victoria is concerned, there has been a real um, upping in the resources around their inspectorate, 
to do with psychological safety and it's really a key part of their 2030 strategy so um, you know I think you can expect that if they are, they are um, doing it performing inspections and so on they will be looking at psychological safety um, but more commonly what we see uh, is those workers' comp claims. And as I've already said, they can be very difficult um, to manage and it can be difficult to rehabilitate that worker back to their full capacity or even get them back to the workplace at all. So uh, in an ideal world, we'd be wanting to avoid them from being made in the first place. Thanks, Tanya. Um, so in terms of monitoring health of employees, I think we'll all agree that uh, having conversations around workplace mental health, particularly in the current COVID context, has never been more important. Um, and I think there's a few instances where we want to be having conversations. Um, and I, I sort of, I guess, um, delineate between more formal instances and then more ad hoc informal instances. So in terms of formal in considering whether someone who's an applicant for, for employment is capable of fulfilling the inherent requirements of their role. So that's asking some questions as to whether they have any pre-existing injuries or conditions that would prevent them from fulfilling the inherent requirements of the role, or if they'd be at risk of an exacerbation. And certainly that requires you to actually inform them as to what those inherent requirements are so they can make an informed disclosure. And if they happen to make a disclosure and say, yes, I have X mental illness, um, that's not the end of the inquiry, but then you need to have a conversation as to, well, you know, are there reasonable adjustments that could be made if they were offered the role um, to enable them to fulfil the inherent requirements? Um, and so that's covering off really both on your safety obligations, but also um, avoiding unlawful discrimination in that, in that space. And it also applies if you have concerns during employment as to whether someone is capable of fulfilling the inherent requirements based on a mental illness. And you can, you do have the lawful right to have them independently assessed if you have concerns around that. Um, and again, that would be against inherent requirements. Um, the more informal space is, of course, having the ongoing conversations around um, mental wellbeing in the workplace. And, you know, really critical is having those dis discussions early and often. So if a leader and, you know, leaders and managers have a really critical role to play here because they're in effect the eyes and ears of the organisation. Um, and if they know their people well, then they can identify change, which can then be, you know, a trigger for let's have a conversation. Um, I think it's so important because what we, if we're having those conversations early, we have to be prepared that someone might not be ready to make a disclosure on that first occasion. So continuing the conversation, continuing the check-ins and particularly bearing in mind the very challenging environment we're currently in, um, I think it, it's really critical and it's part of that piece of normalising discussions around mental wellbeing um, and continuing the conversation to hopefully um, prevent issues from escalating and also, you know, um, reinforcing for the individuals that the support is there if they need it. Thanks, Tim. Um, so just some examples, um, you know, and there's so many things you can do in this space and there's certainly no silver bullet in terms of managing mental health in the workplace and ticking the box. And Tanya is certainly gonna go into a lot more detail around strategy, but some very quick ones off the top to bear in mind. Firstly, avoiding inappropriate workplace behaviours is really key um, so that we're not, you know, having uh, mental illness or mental health problems developing in the workplace on account of the way employees are interacting. So doing your um, anti-discrimination, bullying and harassment training at regular intervals, also really important from a perspective under anti-discrimination law. Um, also having your leaders understand how to conduct reasonable management action in a reasonable manner is really key. Um, and because there are so many risks that can flow both practical and legal um, if they're not doing so. Um, also ensuring leaders understand how to identify those red flags. It's not identifying um, or, you know, diagnosing individuals, but um, being able to see that there's that change so they can have that discussion at an early stage. Um, and also encouraging staff to speak up 
So if they see that there are any unsafe work practices or they have concerns about somebody else's well-being, that they feel that they're safe to actually make that, um, uh, raise that issue and trust that it will be, you know, addressed accordingly. And, you know, part of that is really making um, wellbeing and um, psychological safety part of the fabric of an organisation. So that's not something that you can click a switch and um, people will suddenly feel safe, but a lot of the things that Tanya will talk about will actually address that. And so people will feel more emboldened to um, speak up. Um, leaders obviously have to lead by example. They have to model those um, psychologically safe work practices. If they're burning the midnight oil every single day and um, there's an unspoken expectation that everyone else does it, that's just going to have an insidious impact and obviously can really impact wellbeing. And finally, again, if they've got concerns about someone's ability for, to fulfil the inherent requirements of their role or whether they're doing okay, start that discussion early and often and act on it, um, not just about legal compliance and avoiding legal risk, but really about ensuring that person has the best opportunity to get the support they need um, so that they can then continue to be engaged in the workplace and thrive. And that's obviously in everyone's interests. Thanks, Tan. Okay, thank you so much, Georgie. There were a couple of comments coming in around reasonable management action. Um, and Michael, there was a question from Michael in the Q&A. We might just hold that over until the end, if that's okay, because uh, it may need a, a deep answer from you, Georgie. So we might just keep going. Thank you so much. Okay, <clears throat> so now, you know, you, you've got two great um, lots of information already. Um, you know, the why, the business case for a mental, mentally healthy workplace strategy, uh, the, the legal uh, implications and some great guidance from Georgie, which were really fabulous to hear. And so I wanted to share some tips on, um, you know, how you can go about creating your, your mentally healthy workplace strategy or whatever you want to call it. Um, and, you know, these, 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 these tips mirror best practice, but they're definitely, uh, from my experience, working in this, play, in this space. So um, firstly, they're not really in any order, but if we, if we go left, um, getting executive commitment is really very important. And I say that with a bit of a caveat. So there's a couple of things to this. Those that have got you know, change management background or experience will know that uh, you know, it's something like six times more likely for a change project to succeed if there is active and visible executive sponsorship. So you know, there's a strong case there. But I also want to... You know, I've driven change of this nature internally from kind of the general major level when I didn't really have the executive director um, level buy-in or support. So I'm just wanting to say, you know, don't give up if you don't think you've got that executive commitment. Some of you will need to um, do some of that influencing uh, from bottom up, I suppose. And, you know, I, I would say it is, it is achievable, but it's a, a way bigger mountain. So get your supports around you. And I'm really happy to have a side conversation with anyone about that kind of stuff. Um, there are definitely pros and cons. When you consider your resources, it's obviously one of the biggest barriers for organisations undertaking this piece of work. There's no shortage of information. There's great guidelines and evidence-based material on many different sites. There's so many different agencies playing in this space right now. But that in itself is a barrier in that it's overwhelming. And, you know, the clients come to me and literally say how uh, you know I've sat in a boardroom pre-COVID and had a director literally throw me the beyond blue pack and say just help me like I've been trying to get to this for so many months I know we need to do it I just don't have time to read I think one of the guidelines is like 56 pages long you know so there is a good argument for having some sort of external support as well if you don't have the internal resourcing but consider who's going to kind of take the lead so ideally, you have a bit of a, a blend. So you've got, you know, people in culture and, and or OHS teams leading the work with support externally if they don't have enough resources internally. Now, this is a long game. This is a strategic change of direction. This is a three-year-plus project. So, you know, just bear that in mind. It will need a commitment in resourcing, okay? And the other thing is around workplace wellbeing, working groups. Um, so if you don't have one, form one. If you've got one already and you don't have a strategic approach to having a mentally healthy workplace, my caution for you is just to make sure expectations are clear for that group. What we find in these groups are really passionate people about their particular thing. And I've seen you know, lots of different um, 
Examples of this in workplace wellbeing groups, and, and it can be those that are passionate about diversity inclusion, it can be those that are passionate about physical wellbeing, um, you know, they're your marathon runners, and um, it's those that are mainly really passionate about yoga and mindfulness and the more, um, you know, I guess psychologically um, supportive strategies. But we need people, and we need that, you need them to bring those energies, but we also need people to realise that, that there's going to be a strategy and there's going to be an approach that might be, you know, in the first six months, ticking off some of the legislative stuff and making sure you're um, you're protecting the organisation, which might not be sexy to them. So again, I'm happy to have a conversation with this. Very, it's just a caution to just have a look at your group currently um, and consider extending the group if you need to. Make sure you've got representation on there that can uh, the path clearers, the decision makers. You do need to feed in. Um, in this work, you do need to be feeding in to that executive level and or have the exec sponsor on board. Again, you know, each one of these we can have a lengthy discussion about. To co-design or not to co-design, this is why I particularly ask you about the size of your organisation. Um, again, I've, you know, I've had the gamut of really large organisations and I haven't had a one-person organisation yet. There's always time for that. Um, you know, I think probably 30, 30 to 40 um, staff members. And, this, there's pros and cons to both, all right? So when we talk about co-design, it's about getting input from your people. Obviously, you know, when there's workplace change, you do have some industrial requirements to do that. But particularly to help inform the detail in the strategy and the activities in the strategy, um, to get buy-in from your people to help with the change because, you know, you obviously need to, to have that momentum on the ground. But if you're a large organisation and you want to do a full co-design piece, you know, we're talking about six and a half thousand staff, that's going to take you a couple of years <laughs> in reality to get that done. So as a ballpark, you know, to do full co-design um, with an organisation that's got about 1,200 staff, we probably worked for eight months um, on that, which was, you know, right from conceptual to implementation and really beautiful case study. Um, really great involvement, lots of presentations to staff, leadership team, other developmental work that took place to really help embed this strategy. But that's just a ballpark for you. So, you know, there's lots of different ways to approach um, undertaking a strategy. Happy to have a side conversation. Um, my website address is there. You can actually book in like a free 15 minute discussion with me. I'm really happy to do that for any of you to help guide you on how you might approach this in your workplace. And the develop comms and change plans, again, it's understanding this is a long view, okay? This is not a quick win activity, hence your fruit bowl. That's a quick win activity. You know, this is a long-term change project. So you need to approach it as such. Large organisations, if you're lucky, I hope you've got some change managers on board, bring them in to, this, to the project discussions because you will need them to help influence the communication that goes out and the change plans, because you will need a change plan. At the end of this presentation, there is a, a giving you kind of a, a screen of, of, of tips for those that don't have change managers in place um, to really support you in this place, because this is really helpful for implementing your strategy. Okay. I just want, I also want to say, you know, sometimes the workforce, that the impact to your culture and to, to your, to re-engaging your employees occurs purely from announcing the intent to do this work. And it was certainly the case with one organisation I supported who, who kind of had a self-elected uh, workplace wellbeing group who'd formed 12 months earlier and were looking for some, I guess, buy-in support direction from the organisation and it hadn't come to fruition. And, you know, the, the, the point I got to them to bring them in to do this co-design work that I was doing with them um, you know, they were on the cusp. They just said, we are so delighted that the organisation is doing this work. We were all just about to throw in the towel. You know, some were, some were just fed up. They had enough. Um, they were going to leave. Some were just completely disengaged and disinvested in the organisation as a result. And the flip during that session in those people was amazing. So don't underestimate the power of, of just announcing that you're going to do this work. Um, but don't make it lip service, okay? And obviously, if you've got a, a, a history of um, poor organisational change, it's probably not going to help you too much. Happy to have a chat. But this was really amazing. It was really amazing to see this in that organisation. All right, I'm going to get into some nuts and bolts now on uh, how to go about your strategy. Yep, I know, Nick's flagging me for time. I knew I was going to have a problem with time. 
Um, so I'm going to just, I'm going to go really fast through this. So developing your strategy, um, understand the best practice activities that sit under those three pillars of protect, promote and support. Two web links there that you'll get that information. WorkSafe have some other information, not necessarily whole comprehensive guidelines, but they do have some other good supportive documentation such as this a little um, template checklist for work-related stress prevention. So have a look there. They've got great little videos. WorkSafe have got fab information. That's Vic, WorkSafe Vic. Um, the second thing is to really understand your organisational metrics, data and pain points. Um, those of you that are in the public sector, if you've elected to do your People Matter survey again this year, you, you see that there's a big focus on wellbeing, obviously. It's been changed due to COVID. Um, so you'll get some, you know, some decent information that come out of there. But I also want to just caution you to uh, just be aware of false positives. I mean, I've seen an organisation that had known significant cultural issues, um, like poor toxic workplace culture, that is, um, some really dysfunctional leadership behaviours and relationships, some pretty serious stuff going on there. Um, and in the psychological climate score in their, in their PMS survey, they still rated as okay. So I just, it's just a caution there, okay? Look at it, you need to look at this holistically and um, anecdotal feedback is really important as well. But there's some, a whole heap of data there that will help inform your strategy. Now, obviously your pain points, particularly if they relate to your compliance with legislation, need to become your priority one actions, okay? So in typical risk management, um, in a typical risk management approach. Okay, so I'm just trying to keep an eye on the chat box at the same time. Okay, thanks, Nat. Um, all right, oops. Uh, these are sort of the suggested contents of your strategy. Look, it's a standard strategy um, document with an action plan. Um, that's how I develop them up for the clients. They've got the sort of an introduction luxury section, which is really the organisation's strategic commitment, why they're doing it, the context, I guess. Um, now, when the ones that I'm writing for organisations, I'm very much putting in some mental health stats, which obviously will change now, uh, and painting the picture. And I also include the mental health continuum. Now, if you haven't seen that, um, just go and Google mental health continuum. It's a great visual representation of how, over time, all of our, all of our mental wellbeing can vary. And I do this because it creates instant awareness and helps organisations to understand their role. This is not just about supporting people who have a mental illness, it's about trying to keep everybody in this green, healthy, functioning zone. And I find that critical. And in fact, that continuum leads so many really positive discussions. Uh, and we build that in as a bit of an awareness raising activity into our action plans when I'm working with clients on that. So your mentally healthy workplace goals obviously come out of that statement and they're usually protect, promote, intervene or support. And then you've got your objective statements from those goals. You know, I don't need telling you how to suck eggs, how that all flows down. I also put some information in around governance because sometimes it's about, well, what does the governance structure need to look like to monitor this work? Because you need to monitor obviously and report. Some organisations, they've got board sign off on their strategy. So there's a board reporting. Others, it can be their audit and risk committee that they're reporting to. So it varies, again, depending on the size of your organisation. Now, I'm just going to give you a very sneak peek. Um, and some of this is scraping holes because there was some, uh, you know, some identifiable information in there. But this is taken directly from one of the strategies that I've um, developed for a client. So they're the goals. It's not rocket science, protect, promote, intervene. It comes out of the guidelines. They're the best practice pillars. And then we break it down into the objectives. So if we look at, let's look at intervention number two, you know, building capacity for leaders to support employees with mental health conditions. So as Georgie was saying, you know, building that capacity to know what those red flags might be, to understand their role is not to provide counselling or diagnostic services, but to direct if there's um, concerns around wellbeing. Snapshot these if you need to, folks. There will be a recording, um, so you can access it again. But this is, again, this is a very cut down version because I'm protecting the privacy and also my intellectual property, I suppose. But this is what part of the action plan will look like. So drawing on that objective around building capacity for leaders, you know, we start to look at what those activities are. This particular client um, wanted to roll out mental health first aid training for the whole management level. It was gonna be cascaded over time. I've had other smaller clients who, um, you know, they have a mandate that at any one time they will have a minimum of 10 
people in their organisation trained in mental health first aid. It is a fabulous program. It's not all you need to do. Again, it's this holistic approach. Um, I wholeheartedly recommend it and I, and I do recommend the Open Door um, Coaching Mental Health First Aid Program. I've done it. It's brilliant. Nick's a very good facilitator. He brings it very well. Um, incredibly insightful and very helpful for your role as a leader in an organisation. So if you haven't done it, jump on board to that. And so then we can see the other bits and bobs there too around designing and managing work to minimise harm. We need to actually make sure the, the jobs we've designed and the structures we've got aren't actually contributing to psychological harm. Um, I do a lot of work in the occupational violence and aggression space, so for health services, and we're seeing this in education sector as well. So, you know, we need to bring that into organisations in that sector and so the whole different focus around that as well. So these are just, you know, this is one person's strategy. I just picked a few screen dumps to kind of, for those that are very visual like me, like to see what it might look like. Now, right now you're all probably sitting there going, because this is a lot of information and I really just, you know, dump this on you very, very quickly. Again, depending on where you are in your journey on this, you may be quite developed, you may know the guidelines, have them in front of you, you may be on your way, or you may just be trying here today to figure out what is this all about. You know, don't be scared off. Doing something is better than doing nothing. Um, chip away. Remember, it's a long run game, okay? But also remember that Georgie and I are both here to support you. So these are some of our services that we can um, provide to you to assist you. So I mean, strategy design and development, obviously. Um, and I do have a pre-populated strategy and action plan because sometimes, you know, I've had organisations just say, just send me something so I can start with you know, just to get their feet on the ground to start with it. And then they contextualise and pop their data in it as they need to, but it's a starting place. Um, consultancy and advice, if you're developing your own, um, can certainly help you in the change management consultancy. Because change management is a part of the success of any organisational change, as we mentioned. And Georgie, do you want to just talk to your wonderful services of support as well? Yeah, thanks, Tan. Um, so just some of the things that HR Legal can assist with is around the training piece. So delivering training on appropriate workplace behaviour, both to sort of broader workforce, but also to managers in terms of how they um, ensure people are meeting appropriate standards of workplace behaviour. Um, and also training for leaders in terms of reasonable management action and what does that look like? What are the risks and so on? Um, assistance with implementing policies and procedures. And um, obviously we prepare those and. Um, uh, you know, tailor them for a particular organisation and then of course advice on specific scenarios so whether it's you know someone who's made a disclosure and you know what what should the organisation do what can't they do all that sort of thing um, whether it's a, a particular claim that's been made or assistance in managing a workers comp claim or the implications of that and so on so um, yeah that's us in a nutshell. You. So you can find us both on LinkedIn, connect, and we do share, both of us quite active in sharing a lot of guidance material on our LinkedIn pages as well. So um, reach out. Here's the tips I promised you around. So I'll give you a moment to do a screenshot of that, folks, if you want to take that. Um, those of you that have done your coaching training will know there's some great coaching questions in there around coaching through change. But uh, specifically, these are sort of um, questions designed to, to help you get buy-in to help challenge um, change resistance in your organisation. And the information on comms, again, it's really important. The communication is very important when it comes to change, um, even as much as, you know, who's communicating in the organisation and, yeah, their perceived role. So, again, I'm happy to have a chat with you about that. It's very important, for, particularly for large organisations. Hopefully you've all had a moment to, to do that. Okay, that was really fast and a lot of information. Um, are there any, I just, I will read out Marcus' question to you, Georgie, if that's okay. Um, and then we'll go to the chat box and, and Nat and Nick if there's any other questions. But Marcus' question, Georgie, was what is there for employees to disclose a mental illness impacting their safety at work? Uh, I think, is that their concerns about their safety if they disclose a mental illness? Michael, is that? what the context was. Do you want to just pop it in chat? Thanks, Karen.
Georgia, I was actually assuming that that was um, that Michael actually might have left out a couple of words there. I wonder whether the question might be, what is the um, legal requirement for an employee to disclose a mental illness impacting their safety at work? Um, yeah, sure. So in terms of um, pre-employment, um, you know, the, uh, the obligations really arise once someone is employed in terms of safety obligations to, you know, take reasonable care for their own safety, to follow directions of the employer with regard to safety and so on. Um, there is, you know, a risk if someone doesn't uh, make a disclosure when asked um, pre-employment, if they are um, provided with, uh, I guess, um, an indication that a failure to make a full disclosure can impact future workers' comp um, entitlements, there, there can be um, a carve out from the entitlement to compensation if someone then suffers an exacerbation um, that you, the employer has to go into quite a lot of detail in terms of make, uh, providing that caution, but that's one potential impact. Um, but I think the main issue would be on a practical level that that person isn't then getting the support that they need in the workplace and their safety may be compromised. They may not be getting the reasonable adjustments they need and so on. So an employer is gonna have trouble meeting its own obligations with regard to safety and under anti-discrimination legislation to make reasonable adjustments. Um, but in terms of the impact legally for that employee, it could be around workers' comp if they then have an exacerbation. And depending on the circumstances, you know, I've seen cases where it's had disciplinary consequences. It's certainly not a case that if someone doesn't disclose, that's instantly, you know, grounds for dismissal. I wouldn't be suggesting that at all. There has been cases where, you know, it's impacted integrity and those sorts of things. But really, I think it's more, more about the employer and the employee working together so that everyone's fully informed and then that person can get the support they need to succeed in the workplace. So that's probably the more important piece than rather the legal exposure to either. Thank you. Okay, there's just a, a couple of other um, comments in chat that I've just responded to. Um, yeah. Hopefully everybody's not sitting there um, rocking in the corner after <laughs> all of that amazing information. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. If there's no um, no further questions, yeah, it's been a, it's been a pleasure. Thanks everybody, and good luck on your journeys. Um, keep up the fabulous work. Yeah, thank you um, to you, Tan, and to you both, Georgie. I I really appreciate it. I think how you were able to bring the heart based, the economic, and the legal considerations um, to us today during your presentation really as you say taking that holistic approach and focusing on the strategic approach rather than as you say just the fruit bowl and the yoga classes so we've really appreciated your wealth of knowledge and experience there and I think also um, there's a lot of appreciation coming through the chat box uh, for you both as well and really um, giving us a really practical understanding of what psychological safety means and what we can do as leaders, as coaches, as managers to ensure that um, on our teams. So on behalf of Open Door Coaching, thank you to you both. Um, you have mentioned uh, mental health first aid training and Nick is on the line at the moment if anyone would like to talk more about mental health first aid training that Open Door is running. Um, and if you're keen to um, support us as well, we are doing the One Step Forward for the Black Dog Institute uh, and we are clocking our kilometres, uh, our virtual kilometres. Um, so if you'd like to make a donation to the Black Dog Institute or Love Me, Love You, who are also supporting our, our mental health awareness conference, please feel free to do that. But um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, thanks coming through to the chat box for you both, um, Georgie and Tan. Thank you so much for your time today. And we look forward to connecting with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us today.